This is a selection of revision questions for the AS chemistry topic of kinetics. These are the facts that you need to memorise from the specification before you move on to questions asking you to apply your knowledge. All of the questions are in the description below, so download them, answer them, and then check your answers using this video. Collision theory tells us that in order for particles to react, they first need to collide. And when they collide, that may not be a successful collision because they also need to have a minimum amount of energy. And we call that minimum amount of energy the activation energy. So activation energy is the minimum amount of energy required for a successful collision and then the subsequent reaction that comes after it. Rate of reaction can be defined as the change in the concentration each second. And there are three main ways that we could monitor the progress of a chemical reaction. We could look at a change in mass, but that would only be possible if this is a reaction that either produces a gas or where one of the reactants is a gas, because otherwise we wouldn't see that change in mass because of the conservation of mass. And we could monitor that using a balance. Or we could look at a change in turbidity, which is cloudiness, or a change in colour. And those could be monitored either using a photocell or using a colorimeter. And then finally, we could look at the production of gas directly. In order to collect that gas, in order to monitor the rate of reaction, you could either use a gas syringe to collect that gas directly, or if that was not an option, you could collect gas over water using an upturned measuring cylinder. So this is also what we call the water displacement method. Most collisions don't lead to a reaction because when they happen, the particles don't have energy greater than or equal to the activation energy. There are also some other reasons. For instance, it may be that the particles need to be in a certain um, orientation in order for them to be able to react. And that's one of the ways in which catalysts can help to reduce the activation energy and therefore increase the number of successful collisions. A Maxwell-Boltzmann graph shows you the energy profile of the different particles in a sample. So on the x-axis, you need to have energy, and on the y-axis, you have number of particles or frequency. The curve itself is basically a normal distribution that has been skewed towards the right-hand side. And on this, we would mark the mean energy as being slightly to the right of the peak of the curve, whereas the peak itself represents our most probable energy. The activation energy is going to be somewhere over towards the right hand side usually, although remember it will be different for different reactions. So the crucial thing is that where you're labelling it, you're going to be labelling it touching the x-axis. So if you were going to mark a point, it would be here, it wouldn't be on the y-axis here, that would be wrong. The total area under the curve represents the total number of particles, and that's important if you're going to put more than one curve on the same axes. So, for instance, if we were going to double the concentration of a particular volume, then we would be doubling the number of particles, and therefore the area under the curve would also double. But if we were changing the temperature of a particular reaction and not affecting the concentrations or the volumes, then although the graph would move and would be skewed in a different direction, the overall area would be the same. The curve doesn't cross the y-axis because if it did, if we had it touching here, this would imply that we had a certain number of particles that had zero energy. And the only way that something could have zero energy is if it was at absolute zero. And we know that in real life, that's not something we've yet managed to achieve. So you're never going to have any particles that have no energy in your reaction. If we're going to draw another curve for a temperature increase, it's going to look a bit like this. So crucial things to bear in mind. Firstly, it's skewed to the right hand side. So what this tells us is that we've given these particles more energy and therefore the most probable energy is higher than it was before. Because if you give every particle slightly more joules, then the most probable one will also be higher. The second thing is that because the area under the curve still needs to be the same and it's now wider and shifted to the right, the peak needs to be lower down in order to keep that area the same. And then finally, you should only have your two lines crossing in one place. So we cross my original curve here, but then it doesn't cross back. It stays above here. So it's still asymptotes, um, but it doesn't cross back underneath the original curve. As you increase the temperature of a chemical reaction, you're going to increase its rate. This is because the particles have more energy, and this is going to cause two things to happen. 
Firstly, because they have more energy, they're moving faster, and therefore the particles collide more frequently. But also far more importantly, a greater proportion of those particles are going to have energy greater than or equal to the activation energy. And that means that more of the collisions that happen will be successful collisions. Increasing the temperature is going to have more of an impact than increasing the concentration because of the number of particles that are affected. So if we double the concentration, then we double the number of particles in the same volume. And therefore, simplistically, we're also going to double the number of collisions. However, if we increase the temperature, then rather than just having twice as many particles being able to have successful collisions, we're actually going to have many, many more particles having energy that is greater than or equal to the activation energy. Required practical activity three is one of the more straightforward in AS chemistry, but there's still a huge amount of detail that you need to include in a method if you're going to get six marks for this. So in this investigation, we're going to look at the impact of temperature on the rate of a precipitation reaction. So this is one where we mix solutions and produce a solid product, and this is going to make the reaction turbid or cloudy. And this could be monitored either using a photocell or more commonly in a school laboratory, we'd use a disappearing cross method. So where you'd have a flask on a piece of paper with a cross drawn on it, and at the point at which you can't see that cross anymore, you would stop a stop clock. Obviously, if you're using a photocell, then this can be done automatically, where you have a certain amount of light that you expect to be coming through that solution. And when the light sensor cannot detect that amount of light anymore, then the stop clock is stopped automatically. The classic example of a reaction to do this with would be hydrochloric acid and sodium thiosulfate, but other reactions are available. Now, before you start writing your method, you want to consider your variables. So firstly, your control variables, because if these are not controlled, then you won't have valid data. And it's up to you whether you want to say, I'm going to control the volume, or often it's easier to just talk about this in terms of, I will measure out 10 centimeters cubed of acid, which implies that you're controlling the volume. So our first control variable is going to be having the same volumes of both solutions. And then also you're going to need to have the same concentrations of both of those solutions. In terms of um, the independent variable, you're changing the temperature and so you need a way of doing this. And we want the temperature to remain as constant as we can throughout the reaction. So typically we would use a water bath to change the temperature. Now for the dependent variable, we're not actually able to measure the rate of the reaction directly. So what we do here is we use a surrogate. We use one over time or the reciprocal of time as a surrogate for rate. And this is a reaction where we're able to do this because the concentration is going to be changing by the same amount each time. We're basically going to assume that it takes the same mass of sulfur in every single experiment in order to block out the cross. And therefore we can use the change in concentration as just being the same every time. And we can do that because we're not changing the amount of particles in any of these reactions. We're just altering the temperature, which doesn't actually have an impact on the concentration. So this method, firstly, we need to separately warm and measure these solutions. So you might want to say here, I'm measuring out 10 centimeters cubed of acid. I'm measuring out 10 centimeters cubed of sodium thiosulfate because that's just easier than saying I'll control the volume. And of course, they need to be warmed separately to one another because as soon as they mix together, you're going to start that reaction. So you need to have separate measuring cylinders, separate areas to warm them in, and they are warmed in the water bath. Now, when you do this, it's important that we actually know what the temperature of the solutions is. So you might want to refer to the fact that you're going to have the thermometer in the reagents. The thermometer is not in the water bath because it would be very easy for you to have a water bath at 50 degrees, but actually your acid isn't up to temperature yet. So it's important that you're actually measuring the temperature of your solutions. And depending on how you're doing the experiment, if you're doing it in a conical flask on a piece of paper rather than in McCartney bottles in a water bath, um, then you, you need to know what the temperature of the solutions are over the course of the experiment because they're going to change. They're going to cool down once you've taken them out of the water bath. So you might want to talk about how you take the temperature at the start of the experiment and at the end of the experiment and then record the mean because that way you actually know what temperature the solutions were at on average while they were reacting. So we've measured our solutions out and we've warmed them up and we know what temperature they're at. Then we're going to either place our flask on our piece of paper with a cross or the McCartney bottle um, 
would be in a water bath where you've drawn the X in permanent marker on the bottom of that um, plastic tub. And then we're ready to mix the solutions. And as you mix them, you simultaneously start the stop clock and then you watch very, very carefully. And when the cross is no longer visible, that is the point at which you stop the stop clock. Then, of course, we need to talk about actually changing the temperature, actually changing our independent variable, because quite often students get to the end of writing all this and then forget to say, do it again with a different temperature. So we want quite a few different temperatures, um, but you should be conscious of this particular reaction that because it produces quite a lot of sulfur dioxide, which is not very good for you, um, you should really have a maximum temperature of 60 degrees, maybe even 55, just to keep it as safe as possible. And then, of course, it's not enough to do each experiment once. We need to repeat at least three times. And that's three times where you have three good pieces of data. So if you have any anomalies, you, of course, need to discard them. And then once you have those three pieces of data, you can use those to calculate a mean. As you increase the concentration of one of your reactants, you're going to increase the rate of reaction. And the reason for this is that at higher concentrations, you have more particles within the same unit volume and therefore you're going to have more frequent collisions. Now, in most reactions, as the reaction proceeds, the rate of the reaction will decrease. There are some reactions this isn't true for, particularly if one of the products is able to act as a catalyst. But for most reactions, this is the case. And the reason is that as the reaction goes on, the reactants get used up. So the concentration of those reactants will fall. And then because we have a lower concentration, there are fewer particles in the same volume, so there are fewer collisions. Our answer for increasing pressure is very similar to our answer for increasing concentration. So at higher pressure, we have a higher rate because there are more particles in the same volume and therefore there are more frequent collisions. A catalyst is a chemical that can speed up the rate of a chemical reaction without being used up itself. And it does this by providing an alternative pathway and that alternative pathway has a lower activation energy. When we look at this on a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, we can see that if here is the activation energy, all of the particles to the right of that line are able to react because they're able to successfully collide and they have sufficient energy. And so the reaction happens. Now, when we add a catalyst, the activation energy is further to the left because it's providing that alternative pathway with that lower activation energy. And that means that all of the particles that could already successfully collide and react can continue to do so. But also there's lots more particles that now have the activation energy. So we can say that there are more particles which have energy greater than or equal to the activation energy, and therefore they will have successful collisions. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you found this a useful contribution to your revision for A-level chemistry. If you did find it useful, then let me know in the comments below, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more A-level chemistry resources coming soon.